Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. Uh, one of the perks of my job is every once in a while you get a preview copy. Actually, not every once in a while. I get about four or five books a week and several uh, articles a week. But the upside of that is you get a sneak peek into things that uh, I know that our folks are going to want to know about and, and, and hear about. You might remember just uh, uh, several months ago here on the Breakpoint Podcast, I had the privilege of interviewing my guest who is back with us today. Uh, one of, uh, I think, uh, one of the more important public intellectuals uh, in American culture, uh, certainly one of the more important conservative intellectuals, uh, tremendous writer who uh, has written, uh, I mean, it, it would be, she's written a ton, so it would be hard to kind of sum it all up, but specifically the work that she's done on the sexual revolution and the impact of the sexual revolution has been just absolutely uh, must reading if you really want to understand the impact on American culture. Mary Eberstadt, you might remember we talked to her about her tremendous book, Primal Screams, just a, a couple weeks ago, and we'll link to that at breakpoint.org if you come visit us. But she's got an article that is uh, just out in uh, First Things. Of course, First Things is a, uh, one of, uh, uh, one of the, uh, I, I think, the must-subscribe publications in America uh, based out of New York City, founded by the late Richard John Newhouse, who was a close collaborator of Chuck Colson. Uh, Mary uh, Eberstadt has written a article that I think explains so much of what we've seen over the last couple months. It's called The Fury of the Fatherless. And in light of our recent conversation with Dr. Anthony Bradley, I just thought about fathering, I just thought this conversation was incredibly important. Uh, Mary Eberstadt, welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast again. Thank you, John. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Well, you know, first of all, when, when I read articles like this, I think two things. Wow, this is a very, very helpful analysis. And secondly, she's going to get in a lot of trouble for this one. I think you're gonna, <laughs> you might get in a lot of trouble for this one, but I don't think that's probably uh, strange territory for you. Uh, I'm just going to let you uh, give us the main thesis here, uh, which I think people can gather from the title, The Fury of the Fatherless, but give us the main point. Well, I think we're used to thinking of fatherlessness as an easily documented um, social science fact. But in this piece, I'm trying to widen the aperture to force us to look at what 60 years of the sexual revolution has wrought. And in particular, I zero in on what's been happening in American streets since May. Uh, and it is really remarkable. I start with some statistics about how prevalent these protests and in some cases riots have been. And the argument of the piece is that we have to understand that these young people in the streets are sometimes literally fatherless, often, uh, very often figuratively fatherless. And I'm not just talking about the presence of a dad in the home, as important as that might be. I'm also talking about the way in which Zoomers and millennials have been disconnected from the idea of a heavenly father I'm talking about the fall off in organized religion and also the way in which many have been disconnected from their country, uh, the lack of patriotism in the younger generations. And I'm not pointing at that to complain about it. What I'm trying to make is the case that we have here a threefold breakdown of the paternal principle. And what that means is we have a lot of young people in this country who are desperate to know who they are and who can't answer that question by resorting to their family ties. And in the piece, I also get into the revival of racialism in America. I talk about what I call the new racialism, uh, these best-selling books about how to be anti-racist, et cetera, et cetera. And without mentioning people by name, I'm able to show that when it comes to the micro level, uh, the biographies of some of the people who are leading us into this new racialism um, are also very often the story of disrupted homes and in particular filial rupture. So I think it's very important to understand, John, that, you know, the sexual revolution was supposed to be some private matter, right? Everybody right. thought it would just change relations between consenting parties it's having much wider ramifications than that. And as you know, I also argue that this is tied to identity politics, that we have to ask the question, why are so many young people 
desperate to construct identities for themselves, to find political collectives that will answer that question, who am I? And again, the reason is that we are seeing what 60 years of serious family disruption is now doing uh, on a social and political level. So I want to read uh, just one paragraph here from this article. Your book, Primal Screams, was uh, what was that kind of uh, innovative take that the sexual revolution has been connected to this reemergence of identity politics. And it's almost in this article, you're kind of saying, see, I mean, this is what I was talking about in the book, but it's right, you know, as recent as yesterday in, in culture. But but I want to I want to read this. It's it's uh, almost a, one of, one of your paragraphs here. Six decades of social science have established that the most efficient way to increase dysfunction is to increase fatherlessness. This is the United this is the United States has done for two generations now. Almost one in four children today grows up without a father in the home. For African Americans, it is some sixty five percent of children. I'm going to go to that statement. Six decades of social science have established that the most efficient way to increase dysfunction is to increase fatherlessness. Uh, walk us through what that social science tells us. Well, this is exactly what every sociologist knows and very few sociologists want to admit. There is a library of evidence about what happens when you take the biological father out of the home. Um, that act is linked to greater rates of dropping out of school, promiscuity, drug and alcohol use, uh, psychiatric problems, et cetera. And as I say, everybody knows this, it's been documented in every uh, important journal, but for reasons good and bad, people don't dwell on it as scholars. Um, the good reason is that of course, people don't want single moms to feel bad, Single moms do heroic work. Um, but the bad reason is that we've had this sort of tacit agreement. I mean, we, the intelligentsia, we, the respectable public, according to which all of these choices are neutral, right? They're supposed to be socially neutral. And the reason I wrote Fury of the Fatherless was to make the case that these are not, in fact, neutral choices. When you look at the public square today, you see that the collapse of family life, the collapse of religious life, and the collapse of faith in country, all happening together, um, has left a sinkhole out there into which more and more young people are falling. So these are not, in fact, morally neutral choices. Uh, at some point, the, the state will have to choose more wisely uh, which kind of choices to get behind. So one of the things you're pointing out here, and if I could, maybe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like you're arguing with the reference to God, the heavenly father, and even, you know, a trusted institutions or state that it's not just that fathers are missing in homes, but increasingly, and I sense this as a dad, just trying to look at, okay, where do I find the resources I need to be a dad? A lot of places I, I'm looking, all I see are things like toxic masculinity, uh, you know, accusations of, you know, basically uh, uh, replacement of the word dad with parent um, and, and the, the complete substitution in same sex homes or things like that. But it seems like increasingly the very idea of fatherhood is missing in American culture. Like, I mean, if we wanted to get it back, where would we turn? That's a great question. Um, let me just clarify a little bit about the, the fatherlessness. Uh, I believe there's a fact that has not been well understood here, which is that these different kinds of filial piety are connected to one another. So it isn't just that the fathers are evaporating from the home. It isn't just that organized religion seems to be in decline. It isn't just that people are less patriotic. I'd like to put the idea out there that these different kinds of uh, negotiations with paternal authority are related to one another. And that in an age where a lot of people don't know what a benevolent literal father looks like, it makes sense that it's harder for them to understand the idea of a benevolent heavenly father, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this kind of filial piety, based on what we're seeing out there, seems to be a muscle that is 
exercise more or less, and the less it is exercised, uh, the more you see that spill over into these other areas. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the collapse of the filial and the collapse of the paternal principle. So let's, let's put it into the context that you deal with here in the art article, which is what we've seen, as you put it, since May. Um, this is things like Neverland uh, in Portland. Uh, these are, you know, protests that became riots. These are, uh, you know, the embrace, large cultural embrace of a, of a movement or, an, or at least an organization, let's put it that way, uh, that as you write in the article, intentionally leaves the idea of fathers out. I'm talking about, you know, the official Black Lives Matter manifesto uh, talks about deconstruction, the, the traditional family, but also, as you point out, which I had noticed, doesn't use the word fathers. Um, now, I, this is where I looked at it and thought this, she's going to get in some trouble by, you know, trying to make this connection. So make the connection by what we have seen, you know, uh, specifically, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it, it, can, can we, can we draw this direct link as, as tightly as you have here? Well, I certainly think so, John. And one reason is that uh, that document that you're talking about, the Black Lives Matter website, has since been amended to take out the language about attacking the nuclear family. But what's really interesting is that fathers and brothers are not mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And the same is true of the very first, the founding document of identity politics, which was something called the Kumbahi River Collective, was the first document, 1977, to use the words identity politics. It was put out there by a group of radical African-American feminists. That document also, although not exactly brief, did not use the word fathers. It was essentially a document saying that we are giving up on the men in our lives to you know, band with us and we think the only people who have our backs are people exactly like us. This is where the idea of identity politics mm -hmm. comes from. So identity politics um, is joined at the root with fatherlessness and a distrust of the paternal principle. And again, I think we are seeing that on the streets. There's another element of this that I think is very important to understand that has been most visible since this summer. And that is that the people who are unmoored in this way, you know, whether literally fatherless or outside of traditional communities, religious communities, et cetera, these people are increasingly furious and mm -hmm. bereft. And some of that, of course, is legitimate because they have been deprived, not through their right. own volition, but they have been deprived of things that all the generations before us could take for granted, like belonging to a robust uh, family with a lot of kinship ties or belonging to a religion that put you in community. And I think we see this furiousness, for example, in some of the social disruptions. Think about the people, protesters who went around and harassed people who were outside eating dinner in certain cities or who go through neighborhoods like Georgetown in Washington, D.C. with flashlights and wake families up in the middle of the night with these flashlights. Um, this isn't just street theater. This is something deeper, I think. What we're seeing is that the people who are disconnected in these elemental ways resent the people who are not bereft as they are. And this is what we're seeing in these uh, demonstrations that try and shake people out of their beds, that try and, you know, uh, bother families who are outdoors enjoying dinner. And it's, it has revealed the frightening side of that, which is uh, that it, this isn't just loss that has been suffered. This is loss that has taken to the streets and is demanding some kind of recompense. Well, well, and, and that's part of it in my mind as well, because when you – in many cases, I mean, they're, they're at some level, probably a level of clarity by some of the protesters or whatever, and, and pointing out legitimate issues of racial, you know, discrimination or bias where it exists and so on. But when you, for some of these 
rioters or protesters, you kind of scratch below the surface and their solution is all over the place. It, you know, it's, 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 it does come across as almost a rage, like, you know, what would fix this for you sort of thing. And it ranges from a racial issue for a group that they may not even be part of, or, you know, sensitive to, to, you know, discrimination against trans lives to, you know, capitalism. And it just seems to be a strange mishmash of issues. And it, points to, at least in my mind, you can tell me if you think I'm wrong, it just, it does point to a rage or a, or a, a resentment or just a things are broken and I can't actually put my finger on what's wrong sort of response. Yes, no one would deny that there's racism and that there's unfairness and discrimination. Right. John, nobody reasonable would deny that. But racism does not explain the extensive demonstrations and riots that we have seen since the summer. Systemic racism is an idea that does not make sense when weighed against the fact that the vast majority of the American public, for example, um, thinks intermarriage is either a great thing or something that's, you know, a matter of indifference to them. In a society like this, you don't have something like systemic racism. And similarly, systemic racism is a very hard argument to make, given that we have two institutions, the military and the churches uh, that are well integrated. So for all kinds of reasons that I spell out in more detail in the piece, I don't think systemic racism explains uh, much of what we're seeing out there at all. There is a deeper, there is a more primordial rage being expressed. And as you say, sometimes it attaches to capitalism. Sometimes it attaches to a sexual minority a perspective. Uh, what's constant is the rage. And so what I'm trying to do is get at where it's coming from. My guest today on the Breakpoint Podcast is Mary Eberstadt. Uh, she is the author of the book Primal Screams. And if you've read Primal Screams, you need to read this article, The Fury of the Fatherless, as a, uh, as a postscript. If you have not read Primal Screams, read Fury of the Fatherless, again, out in the December uh, issue of First Things. And it will be a, pre, a, a, a prelude to the book, Primal Screams, which you'll want to read. But she's connecting some dots that just, you know, haven't been uh, con con connected. Um, I, I want to bring in, um, you know, one of the points you make, which is the connection between this and, and, and kind of the disconnection with national identity or with the state. Talk, talk us through a little bit more what you mean by that. Well, so for uh, at least 10 years, public opinion polling has documented something very unusual, which is that patriotism is declining sharply among the young. Um, and by the young, I mean, again, millennials and Zoomers. So it's very much an age-related thing. Uh, why is that? Well, I think part of the reason, John, is that of uh, the anti-Americanism that is rampant in the academy has done its work. Young people have been listening for a long time now to the message that their country is a bad actor, you know, that it's uh, all warts, <laughs> um, all problematic, and the kind of visions of American history that we see embodied in the 1619 Project, say, uh, are also very much part of that message. But I think there's something else going on as well, which is that people who are weakly attached to the most elemental things like family, religious community, have a lot more trouble attaching to something as abstract as the idea of national identity. So again, I think these changes since the sexual revolution, the decline of family and the decline of faith, are now having consequences that no one could have foreseen. And there is a, a really problematic ignorance out there. I don't say that to insult people. I say that because I think we're really uh, losing a kind of human knowledge about how to thrive, uh, how to live a happy life, uh, that is with reference to ties to faith, ties to family. And some people haven't even been exposed to this sort of idea of the public good or the, the individual good. And, you know, we can lose uh, sight of all kinds of knowledge. There are things that people could do 2,000 years ago that we don't know how to do. Um, and we have to be really wary about this. I don't think this 
disconnection, this widespread disconnection out there among the young is something that we can shrug off. It's got to be engaged for their sake and also for the sake of the country to come. Do you find young people are uh, open to that sort of engagement? Um, you know, I, I, you kind of look at it and, you know, it's, it's kind of, you get to this point in the conversation and think, okay, well, what's the good news? You know, we're, we're, how do we move forward here? Because it is such a, a broken situation. And as you point out, and I think you are, are definitely pointing out something that's important. These are trends that have been in American culture for a while, but something seems to have hit a new pinnacle in 2020. There's kind of, this is a new chapter. There's a new level of anger and rage and distrust. And, and for the record, um, and you point this out in the article as well, you see this in uh, the far right and the far left. This isn't, you know, uh, this isn't something that you see. This is a commonality that both of them share. This isn't, you know, exclusive territory for one or the other. Um, but that group of the far left and the far right seem to either be getting bigger or getting angrier or getting more volatile. Uh, what's the good news? What's the way forward? Well, the good news is I think well, we have to start acknowledging that there is real pain out there and real hurt. And, you know, in this divisive political culture of ours in which one side calls the other side names and leaves it at that, I don't think we make any progress that way. Yeah. So as you say, and as the peace documents, John, uh, this is something that exists on the far right as well as the far left. And it is rooted similarly in this, this hunger to find communities that validate you, that love you, that have your back. I think this is what all of identity politics amounts to. So what's, why should we have hope? We should have hope, first of all, because that pain and that disconnection and that loss suffered by the young since the sexual revolution started has not been acknowledged. And I think they know something's wrong. That's the strongest ground for hope right there, is that they know something is wrong and they are trying to attach that anger of theirs to something consequential like an attack on capitalism or a defense of sexual minorities. I think we can connect the dots for them and say, you're right, something was taken from you. Uh, you have been deprived of important things, but you need to understand what they are and not falsely attach yourself to these political identities that seem to answer all your questions. Your questions are far too fundamental to be answered by political attachments. Yeah. And there's a generational fix, right? Which is start reintroducing fathers to the picture. It's, a, it's amazing. Uh, nothing else is really going to jump in ex and, and be any sort of solution in the long term other than rebuilding the family. And to me, that gives kind of very clear marching orders for the church and for, you know, scholars that want to that want to continue to write and speak on this, uh, as you do, uh, and institutions to re-embrace uh, the family as and its role within society. I mean, it doesn't seem to me uh, that kind of chasing around the cultural brokenness, like, you know, a game of cultural whack-a-mole is the best strategy here. You know, we, we, this, is a, this is clear ground that we can work in. I couldn't agree more, John. And to rebuild the family is also to rebuild the churches. These yeah. things are flip sides of the same coin. And I think uh, one good message for the churches is that there is a lot to work with out there. There are people who just need to get in the door. So these two things, the church uh, and the family, which I, <clears throat> excuse me, which I've referred to before as a kind of double helix, you know, one side needs the other to perpetuate itself. Uh, these two things tend to rise and fall together and strengthening one will strengthen the other. And that's the good news. That is the good news. You can find more about the work of Mary Eberstadt at maryeberstadt.com. Uh, and that last name is E-B-E-R-S-T-A-D-T, -E uh, maryeberstadt.com. Uh, again, her books, uh, Primal Screams. And I also want to mention really, in many ways, probably... Uh, well, I, I want to mention how the West really lost God, which was a remarkable work connecting the breakdown of the family with secularization. It was a new kind of look at this and uh, very, very profound work, which uh, had wide acclaim. And you've written so many books, it's impossible to name them all. So I'll stop there. But uh, this article uh, that we want to uh, send everyone to, and we'll link to it if you come visit us at Breakpoint 
uh, org and click on the link for this podcast. Uh, the article is called The Fury of the Fatherless. The Fury of the Fatherless. You can find it in the December issue of First Things. And again, we'll link to it at breakpoint.org. And I guess, my guess is you'll read this if you haven't read Primal Screams and want to jump right into that book, which is uh, the, 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 that book and this article really go hand in hand. Uh, Mary Eberstadt, it's always good to talk to you here on the Breakpoint Podcast. So grateful for your clarity and for your writing and for challenging uh, the way we think. Thank you, John. It's always wonderful to see you and to connect. Thank you.